Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Uh, I might hate that Landor now. If a smorgasbord became a place, then I honestly think that Simulanka being related to Natlan is exactly that. From the relational concepts that relate to the entirety of the Vat, to the smallest details that may or may not even be part of Natlan's main plot to begin with. And that doesn't even take into account the side quest that made me think that overthinking was an actual problem that I had. But it's not. And here's why. So in today's video, we're going to make sense of as much of Natlan as I could possibly find from the main quest to the side quests of the entirety of Simulanka. The concepts that reflect reality and fantasy that may be related to how Natlan wishes to create their own fate. Ergo Mavuika's goal, the relations that can be seen from Simulanka's views with Tevat as a whole, and how the Hexen Circle and Venti sees the entirety of Tevat. The quote-unquote roles of the people of Simulanka and how it's related to Natlan and the entirety of Tevat's fabricated roles created through Stars and Fate by Celestia. And finally, the dragon Durin and his relations to the real Durin and how the concept of redemption ties with Natlan hero tales and the main story. Either way, the special program is like two days away, so let's see how much of this is true and whether or not Simulanka is even part of Natlan. Timestamps below, so without further ado, let's get started. The world of Simulanka was created by the three goddesses and their separate roles. Hold on to the word role first, okay, because this word is how we'll see how and why everything relates to Natlan. Alice, the goddess of creation, Barbalot, the goddess of prophecy, and Anya, the goddess of fate. Alice created the creatures and the people of the land with magic and matter, and gave the world its own existence. Barbalot gave the fantasy world the stars, allowing Simulanka to move in its own time frame using clockwork devices that endlessly spin. And the goddess of fate who fulfilled the wishes of the people and allowed them to have emotions and express themselves freely and even venture across through different worlds. All who come to Simulanka go to the Kingdom of Bells and Breezes to thank the Goddess of Creation for founding the world, then traveling to Constellation Metropole, the center of stars and constellations, to witness and thank the Goddess of Prophecies' oracles that move their world. And then finally, to make their wish to the Goddess of Fate at the end of the world. Now all three of these roles are needed for the fantasy world of Simulanka to be its own separate world and be autonomous without needing any management at all which might reflect the contrast of this world and the world of Tvet, with its heavy and strict laws of Celestia and their archons that oversee the land. This is an interesting combination, as the rule of three as well as the rule of seven is very prevalent in many of the game's quests, characters, and events. But the differences can be seen from the way the Hexen Circle allow the people of Simulanka to be autonomous and solve their own problems. A way of taking care of the world that only recently became somewhat true in Tvet, if you've noticed. Now this may be how Mavuika intends to take care of Natlan and how Natlan functions as a region. Unbound by the divine authorities and are able to be autonomous but are tied down by their belief in the laws of their creators. Born to be independent but forced to depend on Celestia. Meme template right there. Now you may notice certain themes from each region or area throughout the questline and events of Simulanka. The forest and its initial origin stories of creation and the first instance of divine and prophetic narratives. The city of Constellation Metropole forging beyond divine independence and relying more on one's own power to forge onward into the future. Finally, the Titanium Mines with its themes of accepting your current self but also forging ahead into the unknown despite the fears that one may have of the unknown. Now this becomes more apparent after finishing all the other related side quests like Kirara's detective quest which leads to the message from M and the Venturer's lighthouse quest leading to guiding the people who venture into the outside world. Some possible similarities to Natlan are the titanium mines looking like this cavern here in Natlan as well as the stories of redemption, heroes and of course dragons which we'll go over later. But back to Simulanka, another prevalent theme that you may have noticed is the concept of blurring the lines between fantasy fantasy and reality, allowing what was supposed to be in a fantasy world like Simulanka to enter and even stay in the real world. Durin. This may also make you wonder whether or not which world is real and which is fantasy, because a lot of people are able to go into the fantasy world now, and a lot of the themes within each fantastical event such as these all reflect the world of Tavad if put together. This I think is more of a known fact, as the Hexen Circle members often create things based on real worlds that they've been to and interacted with. Alice creating things like the Golden Apple Archipelago, Barbaloth with her fate and telling prophecies, and now we have Anya, creating stories through her books. 
But this begs the question, is Natlan a fantasy world or is our world of Tevat even real? In addition, are the events we experience also real? Or are they just fantasy based on some higher entity's story writing? A fun game that the gods merely play using mortals in a fantasy world called Tevat. If you think about it, Tevat itself is also already in a weird mix of reality and illusion, with the Ermin Sol in lane line changes in memories, the loom of fate's forbidden power, and even Celestia's prophecies that come true regardless of what you do. What's worse is that all of these can equally be changed and altered, and there seems to be no clear plot device to push a certain end. All except for one character that isn't affected by all of these changes. And that's the Traveler. It makes even more sense when only the senders have the power to change the direction of worlds such as Tevat. But it's not just about changing fate, but it's to create fate. Now the world of Simulanka and its events, other than looking like those mural domains in Tevat, is honestly something that we've seen happen in a prophecy to restore peace in the world. Each character that ended up there had a specific role that they needed to fulfill to progress the story. To return peace to Simulanka, the fairy of creation must save the people of the Bells and Breezes, the king of Constellation Metropole must decide the fate of their kingdom, and the hero pushes into the Titanium Mines and quote-unquote defeats the dragon. Finally, the Traveler acting as a witness to allow traversing between worlds. Alice even mentions that in the way fate works, each character that fits with the role ended up in the storybook, especially Wanderer. If you play the other Simulanka quests, you may notice something called a calling or role that everyone has in the world or at least in the quest. Now within the kingdom of bells and breezes, the frogs have a calling to jump as high as they can and the squirrels to fly and so on. And this also applies to Constellation Metropole and the citizens there who keep the world moving on, as well as the people of the Titanium Mines. Interestingly, the Princess of the Bells and Breezes has a higher calling to find the guardian of her kingdom, and the Champion Frog must be called to save the princess. But in the end, their roles were changed, and they then found a new purpose for their recent callings to create their own fate and their own calling and roles. Before, when those of the fantasy world lose their calling or stray from that path, they would end up losing their memory and fading into obscurity. But at the end of this particular quest, that's not really the case, as every individual has the right to find their own path and are not tied down to the calling or role given by the goddesses. But sadly and terrifyingly, when left to wither too long and not find their own path, they would end up becoming old manuscripts with writings of their remaining thoughts. And the only way for them to move on was to realize the ideals of the current princess of the kingdom, paving the path to their own destinies since the writer of the story has long since passed away. And only her echoes where she still to this day imparts her knowledge to the world to find and solve their own problems. This could be a relation to Tevat and Celestia and the Archons, where the Guardians and humanity are left to their own devices to forge their own paths, all of which many Archons and Guardians and Adepti already stand by. And likely Natlan has their own way to leave Celestia's fate bubble and then forging their own path. Another example of roles is with Karara's investigation quest with the three clans of Constellation Metropole. From the three clans' histories being credible through Anya to fantasies and fairy tales being real. Basically, everything in the fantasy world of Simulanka is in fact real and it's up to those creations to decide what to do with themselves next. This is why the end of the world is also where those who wish to venture outside their world may leave, explore, and make their own fates however they wish. This is mentioned in another quest involving repairing the lighthouse that guides venturers back to their world, and even creating a sun or a star or a moon that guides people back to where they came from regardless of how or where they wish to forge their fate. This is exactly why Anya is the goddess of fate in Simulanka. From understanding their creation in the forest, realizing their life's direction in Constellation Metropole, and eventually finding the courage to forge their own fate at the end of the world. Lastly, the book quest, which honestly made me feel bad for reading into it too much because it's a message about overthinking and overanalyzing things. 
But when you think about the roles played by each character in the quest, rather than focusing on the names that the character circled, it makes a lot more sense. And that each character that we've met had a role in solving the mystery. Albeit some of them made it harder for us to look for the culprit, and I'm looking at you, Tainari, we were also able to narrow down the investigation substantially because of that through Sino. Finding the culprit and why there's so many circled names, looking for the people who vandalized the book, investigating who circled what in that book, and taking in different perspectives from different people and even gods. And even the thought of just replacing the book altogether and just leaving it be. If you think of it this way, you'll notice that each character in that entire questline had a role in solving the mystery, regardless of whatever was written in the book, even though it had King Deshret in it. It didn't really matter because everyone who was related to the book had roles that led to finding the true culprit, which was Kaveh in the end. Anyway, to me, it's not about who did what to the book, rather, what did who contributed to in the quest? Interestingly, all the elements were shown in the quest except for Geo. Again, a missing element, just like in Natlan. Whether or not I'm making sense here is not even worth discussing, since this quest seems more like a message to not overthink and overanalyze, which is exactly what I'm doing. This event and all its quests may also relate to Natlan and Mavwika scene, who forged their own fate at the end of the world where fate and the gods' gaze does not fall. And through the different roles of each tribe in the tournament arc and their specific elements, then we'll be able to create our own fate, that which likely wasn't created by the gods of Celestia, at least for Natlan. But why create fate? Doesn't everybody have their own fate based on Barbaloth and Mona? Well, if you think about it, the entirety of Simulanka is in a stagnated time frame, since Anya died and she can't write her story anymore. The forest and their ink runs dry, halting all progress of creation. The Metropole's clockwork music box stops due to fallen stars caused by the dragon. And the titanium mines trapped due to the rot maxing effects of Durin. Now if Simulanka is a reflection of Natlan and its story, and maybe the entirety of Tavat, then we may see this sort of similar stasis of fate where everyone's lives are unfinished, just like Simulanka when Anya passed away, where each tribe's problems will be solved by the roles of the heroes and their companions, and finding a way to move on from divine writing and forging their own fate. Compared to the other events that focus on friendship, dreams, and adventure, Similanka focuses more on heroes and guardians and prophecies, self-drive and ambition who move forward. So maybe this truly is the direction that Natlan will be going towards. But it may also be how the world of Tavat functions entirely. Moving on, the dragon of Simulanka, Durin, as well as Wanderer being the hero, is quite similar to a certain lore of Natlan, and it's found in an event. It's the concept of redemption, which you may have known from the tale of Kuntur and his redemption story. Now, Natlan might have a redemption arc related to dragons and humanity, particularly about Capitano, Mavuika, and Shbalanke redeeming a time where dragons were once under the rule of humanity. First off, Animo is the one that beat Simulanka Durin, the same way Animo beat the real Durin. But instead of just being defeated, this time Durin was saved by the Wanderer. Through that, maybe the Hexen Circle is telling us something about what actually happened and what was supposed to happen during Durin's attack on Mondstadt. Again, fantasy and reality. The fact that Venti and the Valen defeated Durin and created their poems likely mean that there's an allegory in that poem about Durin's attack or that the events in his tale are not real. Durin was unconscious and Venti likely knew about it. And maybe this creation of fate is also part of Natlan. I mean, Mavwika says, with our own eyes, we will forge our own fate. A tournament arc made not to change fate, but to create their own fate by feeding into their missing element, which is Pyro. A game that is usually played by the gods, now played by humanity because maybe there aren't any gods. Back to fantasy versus reality and redemption, Durin was never truly conscious when he attacked Mondstadt. And weirdly enough, Wanderer was the one given the chance to redeem himself and Durin wasn't. Now this shows how unpredictable and unfair fate can be, something that even astrologers like Mona and Barboloth cannot control and change. 
since creating a similar character in a fantasy world would mean that they would end up with the same fate, but not when you change their roles, which is what happened at the end of the event by giving our blessings to Durin. Blessings of creation, existence, reason, expression, and most importantly, desire. And as for this world, I leave it to you to forge your own fate. Now, this might also mean that Capitano would be the hero of Natlan that either saves Shubalanke or meets with Mavuika in some way, mirroring Wanderer and Durin, a harbinger and a dragon. Remember that the Hexen Circle always does things with a reason and that Venti makes his poems for a reason as well. Durin being revived in the future is definitely something that Venti planned, and Alice helping Albedo after Rhine Daughter and ended up in Dragonspine of all places is definitely planned by some sort of fate that they're creating which is related to how Vanessa ended up in Mondstadt and becoming the Grand Master and Venti waking up in the perfect moment in time. I swear these guys, I have no idea what they're up to but it's gonna be crazy. Now by the end, Simulanka was solved and Durin was accepted into the world in addition to finding friends and going into the real world. This was discussed by Barbaloth and Anya in Scaramouche's trip down the echoes of Simulanka too. So this redemption in the real world for Durin is likely going to happen somewhere in the near future future where peace will finally be restored. We can also find out about the real Durin's memories just like what happened in Simulanka, seeing the world from their perspective. And even better for the lore nerds like us, a possible closer look at Salvin Dagnir if Durin can remove the snow with the help of Albedo, the Wanderer, and Mini Durin. And all of this might honestly be orchestrated by the Thread of a Thousand Winds, Venti as well as the Hexen Zergo. Hopefully Rhine Daughter will also be there, but in the way that they usually do which is talking teacups again. This last segment is about the geography, environment, and fauna of Simulanka that may reflect Natlan and Tevat in some way. The overall design of the fantasy world, although very cartoonish, may be how Natlan's landscapes are designed. But usually with these summer events, it's more about the quests and ideas and concepts that become a sort of prologue for the next region. There's also seven total prevalent life forms in Simulanka. Hamsters, squirrels, alpacas, and the three colors of nutcracker people. Paired with the six heroes and companions that defeated the dragon, as well as the three goddesses and their unique role or calling. Now this may reflect the tribes of Netlan where each tribe has their own role in the region, which we've seen from Wolani, Kachina, and Kenichi's drip marketing lore. Now the lack of color of the forest dwellers was mainly due to the ink bottle underneath the calligraphy tavern being empty, which could be what is happening to Netlands people or Saurians losing their original colors, whatever that would mean. Calling it a fading disorder is likely a term coined from the Vats leyline disorders, but maybe this is a new disorder that relates to the fading of color specific to Netlands events, as well as a certain magic tonic or a scarce resource that the people of Natland desperately need for survival. Now I'm sticking with the lack of pyro for now, but it may also be the lack of ambition or self-drive. And lack of ambition often leads to the loss of memories and even the mind-shattering effects of erosion to some degree. Honestly, this entire video is all conjecture and theory and by all means does not reflect what will actually happen, but because this is a summer event, it often reflects the concepts and themes of the next region's Archon Quest. So I honestly can't not theorize about how everything in Simulanka relates to Natlan, which is why it took this long. From creating fate and redeeming heroes to the roles of everything in the world, we might have the most conflicting storyline ever in Genshin, both in terms of story, lore, and even morality. But that's enough babbling from this sleep-deprived Natlantian because this video is way too long for my liking. So I'll see you guys in the next video which is likely about the 5.0 livestream, yeah? As always, like, comment, and join, subscribe, and hit the bell for more of my ramblings. And stay mad theorists. Bye!